Welcome back to algorithmic game theory. In the last lecture we introduced the problem of revenue maximization and we already derived the equality of expected revenue and expected virtual welfare. Today we are continuing our discussion of maximizing revenue but for a special case namely we assume to have only a single item and we furthermore assume that all distributions are identical. Let's first recap the setting. We have n bidders, which we will again call capital N the set, and we will call them 1 through n. As I was saying, we have one item. And then we have these private valuations, which are v1 through vn. Those are the private valuations of the bidders. Those are drawn from a known distribution. And today, the thing that we're assuming is that this is the same for all bidders i. And this is why I'm dropping here the subscript. So the distribution will simply be called d and not di because all di would be the same anyways. We assume that this has the cumulative distribution function capital F and a density function small f. What we showed last time was that the virtual value function is very crucial. What was that? The virtual value function that was just something that came out of our uh, way of um, solving for the, or finding out what the welfare, uh, what the revenue of a truthful mechanism was. The virtual value associated to value t is the following. We take the value t and then we subtract something. So the, this is something I should have said also last time, the virtual value is always smaller than the actual value because we are only subtracting something. It can even be negative. We've seen example in which the virtual value was negative and usually um, it will be negative for small values. Our assumption is that this virtual value function is strictly increasing. This is just our assumption for today, which means that the distribution that the values are drawn from is regular. This is how it's called. Effectively, this just means that this function should be increasing. And this is the equality that we showed last time. We showed that the expected welfare is equal to the expected virtual the expected revenue is equal to the expected virtual welfare. What was this? The expected revenue of a truthful mechanism is take just the payment rule and see what happens if every bidder bids their true value. What is the sum of the payments that we're getting in expectation? And we compare this to this quantity here. Here, this looks actually like the social welfare. If instead of phi of vi, we would just be writing vi here, then this would be exactly equal to the social welfare. However, now the values are reduced to only the virtual values, and we are then maximizing the sum of the virtual values for the um, uh, for the uh, for our allocation and in particular if we have only a single item maximizing this expected virtual welfare via a truthful mechanism can be done by just maximizing the this inner thing here always choosing the allocation that maximizes the virtual welfare and this means that we assign the bid uh, the item to the bidder whose virtual bid is highest. So just take, see whatever they are bidding, um, apply the virtual value function on those bids and see who 
had the highest virtual bid. And if this is positive, then we assign the item. Otherwise, we keep the item. But what does this mean? What does this mean in case we have a single item? So as you see, I already dropped the subscript i of the fee function because the distributions are all identical. Then there's a much easier way to understand this mechanism because we're applying the same function to all of the bits. This is the first thing that I'd like to observe today. So our mechanism will be choose the I star such that phi of B I star is maximized and if phi of b i star is greater than zero, assign the item to greater i star. And then we charge the payments according to Meyerson's lemma. But what does this mean? How would we first of all choose this i star? Well, if the function phi is monotone and it is even strictly increasing by our assumption, then I star will be exactly the one who bid most. And then we also have to figure out what these things mean. So we might equivalently say we choose I star such that B I star is maximized. And now what we can say is if, well, bi star is greater than phi, the inverse of phi applied to zero, then we would assign the item to bitter i star. So here we are using that phi is strictly increasing. And what would the payments be? Well, we know that the payments in this setting, how much would you have to pay? If you are now bidder I star, you just should bid, uh, you have to pay the threshold, the smallest bid that makes you a winner. And the only thing that we have to determine now, what is the smallest bid that makes you a winner? What does this mean? We can now say that if 
the virtual value applied on everything, everybody, the virtual value of the maximum bid of everybody besides bidder I star is at least zero, then this will be just the maximum of all other bits. Right? So, um, if there is also somebody else who would get the item instead, because they also have a um, non-negative, maybe I should be consistent here and say that this should be strictly greater than zero, although this doesn't actually matter. If also somebody else, apart from bitter I star, would be getting the item, then, well, this bitter I star has to outbid this other bidder, and so this um, smallest bid will exactly be the maximum of all other bids. And what if this is not true? then I still have to bid at least this inverse of the virtual value function applied to zero. So overall, this t, this will be the maximum of two things, namely the maximum of two other uh, of all other bits and the inverse of the virtual value function at zero. Good. What kind of mechanism is this? We are choosing the bidder who bids most, and then if they are bidding something, which is they, if they are bidding at least something, then they're getting the item. Otherwise, they're not getting the item. If they're bidding at least this something, then they have to pay the maximum of this something and the highest, other bit, uh, highest of all other bids. What you can realize now is, actually, this is almost the second price auction, except for that we have a reserve price. We have a reserve price of this inverse virtual value function at zero. So you have to also bid at least this reserve price and you will also have to pay at least this reserve price. So this looks nothing but that we are adding another bidder who is always bidding this reserve price. If that other bidder is winning, then we are actually keeping the item. But if it is not winning, then this also contributes to the possible highest bid. So by introducing more or less this fake bidder, we kind of increase revenue as opposed to when not having this, because it increases the the price the, the payment that has to be made when somebody's winning because maybe um, the second highest bid was smaller than this. Good. So revenue maximization isn't actually always complicated. If you have only a single item and identical distributions, then more or less the 
second price auction will do the trick, except for the fact that you already have to know the reserve price, that you have to suitably set the reserve price. This, by the way, might have might be something that you've also uh, seen before, this kind of an auction format. More or less, when you're bidding on eBay, for example, then they have a starting bid, meaning you have to bid at least this much to be taken into consideration at all. This is what you can actually understand as a reserve price. And also, when you're participating in an auction for some artwork, you will also see the same kind of a, uh, of a mechanism in place that there will be a starting bid, that there will be some kind of a reserve price, and if nobody wants to pay this much, okay, then we are not selling the item at all. At the same time, of course, mechanisms in practice have to take into consideration much more than what we are taking into consideration here, like, for example, that um, the auction quickly converges to things. So there's a lot more to, to think about when you think about designing an auction, but what you see is that it doesn't have to be difficult always. Sometimes a second price auction with a reserve price will be revenue optimal. But what if you want to do things even simpler? What if you just run a second price auction? Will this also be good or not? Yes, it is at least approximately optimal in a very interesting sense. And this is what we will show next. What if now you were still running a second price auction because you're lazy? Okay, this won't be revenue optimal. But we can show that it is still a reasonably good mechanism in terms of revenue if all distributions are identical and regular. Namely, we'll now show two results. The first one being, out of all mechanisms that always allocate the item, this, uh, the second price auction is revenue optimal. Remember that the, um, that the revenue optimal auctions, like for example, the second price auction with the reserve, the point is that sometimes we don't give away the item at all. But if we were now insisting on always giving away the item, then among all truthful mechanisms, the second price auction is optimal. So if all valuations are drawn from the same regular distribution, The second price auction maximizes the expected revenue among all truthful mechanisms. that always allocate the item. Let's show this. How do we show this? Well, we just take any truthful mechanism that always allocates the item and we take our second price auction and we just compare their revenue. And how do we compare their revenue? We compare their virtual welfare. So let M star, which is the pair of 
X star and P star be the second price auction. And M, which is a pair of X and P, be any other truthful mechanism. that always allocates the item. Good. Now, what will happen? Consider any valuation profile V. Let I star be the winner. of M star under V, and we let I prime be the winner of M under V. So we just now run both of these mechanisms, and both always allocate the items. So in the second price auction, we now call the winner I star, and I prime, we call the winner of that other mechanism. And now let's compare the virtual welfare. Well, what do we have? We now know that VI star will be at least VI prime. Why that? Because the second price auction always allocates the item to the bidder who bids most. So if they bid their true value, this will be the maximum value. And so we also have this if we apply the virtual value function, because this is a strictly increasing function. And this means that if we now compare the virtual welfare, this will be V, uh, v i star for the second price auction and this will be at least as much virtual welfare as for that other mechanism. Good. And now, if we take expectations on both sides, then we get that the expected sum of the payments, this will be for the second price auction, will be exactly the expected virtual welfare. And the expected virtual welfare of the second price auction will be at least the expected virtual welfare of that other mechanism. And this will be at exactly, again, this mechanism's expected revenue. Good. So, I really like this statement because it proves something that is somehow always
floating around when you think of how you would you maximize revenue. Somehow this revenue optimal thing is sometimes not to allocate the item because you want to save it so that sometimes you have higher revenue. But if you're not allowed to do this, if you're not allowed to sometimes not allocate the item, then the second price auction is indeed the best that you can do. Um, cool. Now we'll do another comparison of the second price auction, but this time we're even dropping the fact that the mechanisms always have to allocate the item. But we would rather just see what happens if we introduce one further bidder. And this is the following theory. This is by Bulo and Klemperer. From 1996. And it is a little complicated to state, but it is super nice. Consider a regular distribution D for any N natural number. The expected revenue of a second price auction with n plus one bidders drawn from D is at least the expected revenue of U. is at least as high as the optimal revenue, the optimal expected revenue to be precise, with n bidders drawn from D. Good. Let's digest this. We now compare the case that we have n bidders with a case that we have n plus 1 bidders. And in both cases, all bidders are drawn, the, uh, or more precisely, their values are drawn from the same distribution D. Now we'll have the optimal expected revenue for n bidders. And we compare this with the second price auction for n plus 1 bidders. And we now claim that the expected revenue with the second price auction with these n plus 1 bidders is at least as high as the optimal revenue with only n bidders. One way you can think about this is that here in this second price auction, there is just more competition happening. And this more competition, meaning that there's only one more bidder, this is much more helpful, or maybe not much, but is more helpful than carefully crafting your optimal auction 
in this case meaning that carefully choosing your reserve price. So if you know nothing about your n plus 1 bidders and you just run a second price auction, this will give you at least as much revenue as if here you have to know kind of everything about your bidders, at least about the distribution, and you carefully have to choose your reserve price. Interestingly, this is extremely simple to prove when you already have the result that we've just shown, namely that the second price auction is revenue optimal among all mechanisms that always allocate the item. What we'll do now is just we'll turn this optimal um, mechanism in terms of expected revenue for n bidders into a mechanism for n plus 1 bidders which always allocates the item. And then this theorem statement follows just by our lemma that we've just had. Good. What we'll first do is we'll interpret the revenue optimal mechanism for n bidders as a mechanism M for n plus 1 bidders. How do we do that? Well, we have a mechanism that is revenue optimal for n bidders. How do we get a mechanism for n plus 1 bidders? We just ignore bidder n plus 1. And we only run the revenue optimal mechanism on bidders 1 through n. The first thing to observe is that, of course, the expected revenue of this mechanism is exactly the expected revenue uh, of the original mechanism that we're starting that we were starting from, because this the same thing is happening. Now we're only in the setting of n plus one bidders. Now what we do is we transform m into a mechanism. M prime that always allocates the item how do we do this whenever M does not allocate the item Give it to bidder n plus 1. So bidder n plus 1 actually can't do anything because regardless of what they're bidding, here they are totally ignored and then it may happen that m isn't allocating the item to one of bidders 1 to n. Then in n m prime, bidder n plus 1 is getting the item and not paying anything. The revenue of m prime is the same as the revenue of m because whenever we are collecting money we're doing exactly the same thing. And this is also exactly the optimal revenue that you would get for n bidders. Now compare this mechanism m prime to the second price auction. m prime 
runs on n plus 1 items, always allocates the item. The second price auction on n plus 1 bidders does exactly the same. And for that, we know that it is revenue optimal among these mechanisms. So the expected revenue of M prime is the optimal expected revenue for N bidders. The second price auction This has expected revenue on n plus 1 bidders of at least the one that m, ha uh, m prime has. And this proves this theorem. Good. So as we see, the second price auction is already performing pretty good. Here we can see how powerful it is to make this comparison among mechanisms of a certain class, namely mechanisms that always allocate the item. What we'll do next is go to an even simpler mechanism, which, all, uh, which not necessarily always allocates the item, but which will just have one posted price. Now, as I was promising, we're now coming to an even simpler mechanism, which just posts one price for the item and Whoever comes first and is willing to pay this price can buy the item. For a single bidder, this is revenue optimal. Why so? Because this is just what the uh, optimal mechanism looks like. It just fixes a price and gives away the item if the bidder is willing to pay this much. Otherwise, it keeps the item. This is what we've seen last time. But let's now just consider this also for many bidders. Actually, they don't bid anymore, but they just come along and they see a take it or leave it offer. Do they now want to take this item or not? How do you analyze such a thing and how would you choose the price? To analyze this kind of a mechanism, we use a result from optimal stopping theory, which is called a profit inequality. Namely, let y1 through yn be independent, identically distributed, non-negative random variables. And let tau be a threshold with a property that the probability that we see a value higher than tau is exactly equal to 1 over n, or tau is 0 and this the probability that we 
c a value that is strictly greater than zero is at most one over n. And we now let y select be the value of the first yi for which yi is greater than tau. and zero otherwise if there is no such thing. And then we have the following. Then the expected value that we do select, this will be at least one minus one minus one over n to the power of n times the expectation of the maximum of these yi. Good. What does this mean? So we'll have independent identically distributed non-negative random variables, just a sequence of them one after the other. And now we have a threshold tau. And let's first only consider this part A here. If this threshold now has the property that the probability to be greater than this threshold is exactly 1 over n for every of the variables, then the following is true. We now just stop this sequence of random variables at the first time at which we see something that is bigger than tau. Then, the expected value that we're getting this way will be at least some factor times the expected maximum value in this sequence. So what we're doing is we kind of stop the sequence at some point, and at this point we ask, well, how big is this value that we've stopped at, which was the biggest value up to this point because it was the the first to exceed the threshold, but this um, the, the maximum in the sequence might of course be larger. And how much are we losing this way? What might also of course happen is that nothing is above tau. And if nothing is above tau, then we're collecting zero and we're still comparing ourselves against the maximum in the sequence. So that's why you see you wouldn't want to choose this threshold too high, because if, if you choose it too high, then chances are that you're not selecting anything. If you choose it too low, then you stop too early. And we now see what, what we claim is choosing this threshold at the point where the probability that you see something bigger than this threshold is exactly 1 over n, this is a good choice. Or alternatively, it might be that for all thresholds, the probability is actually smaller. And then you choose as a threshold simply zero. And then, so if you have that the probability to choose uh, to see something that is greater than zero is at most one over n, then you could also set the threshold simply to zero. And then you'll pick the first positive of these random variables, so the first one whose value is not equal to zero. Good. Um, what's this factor that we're seeing down here? Um, this is equal to one, if n is equal to one, but also for larger n, this is something nice, this is something that is constant, namely, this will be at least one minus one over e for every n. So, approximately 0.63. Good. Let's now prove this claim.
And what do we want to show? We want to show this inequality here regarding to expectations. And to this end, it suffices to show that the probability that this y select is at least some value z, that this is at least this factor times the probability that the maximum is at least z. And this is something we want to show for all z which are non-negative. Good. So let's show this inequality here. And to this end, we now distinguish two cases, namely, how big is this z? Is this z at most our threshold, tau? Or is it bigger than the threshold? Why do we make this distinction? For every z that is at most the threshold, when do we get that y select is at least z? We get it if and only if we stop the sequence at any point. Once again, we impose this threshold and we stop at the first time at which the, the threshold is exceeded. Now, under which circumstances do we get something that is at least tau? Well, we get it if and only if uh, we stop the sequence at some point. And the, true is, the same is true for everything smaller than the threshold, because we're not collecting anything unless we stop, unless we see a value that exceeds the threshold. Good. So this is our first case. If z is at most tau, then we see that the probability that y select is at least z, this is exactly equal to the probability that there exists an i such that yi is bigger than tau. And what's the probability for this? This is 1 minus 1 minus 1 over n to the n This is true if the probability that yi is, e is greater than tau is equal to 1 over n, because they are all independent. Now there's the alternative that we chose a threshold that is 0, and the probability that yi is greater than 0 is at most 1 over n. But in that case, we'll have that the probability that y select is at least z. This will be just the probability that y select is at least 0. And this is 1, because we assume that those are non-negative random variables. And what do we want it to compare this to? We want it to compare this to the, this probability we want it to compare to this factor times the probability that we see that the maximum value is at least z, but the probability that the maximum is at least z, this will of course be at most 1. And so, no matter which case you're in, uh, no matter whether this or this case, this inequality will always hold. It even holds if you replace this here by 1. Good. Now the more interesting case is that z is actually greater than tau. Although you actually can do still the same kind of arguments. So 
if y is greater than tau, sorry, so if z is greater than tau, then Let's decompose the event that y select is at least z. Namely, how can this happen? This cannot happen if y1 to yi minus 1, those were all not selected, so they are at most a threshold, and yi is at least z. Those are disjoint events and the event that we're looking for here is just their union. So we'll have that the probability that y select is at least z, this will be exactly the sum of these individual probabilities. This will be the probability that y1 is at most tau and y2 is at most tau and so on up to yi minus 1 is at most tau, yi is at least z. And now these are independent events, so we'll have the probability that yi is at most tau times and so on times the probability that i minus 1 is at most tau times the probability that yi is at least z. Now what do we know about all these events? What do we know about the probability that yi is at most tau? Maybe let's go back to our choice of y. And we see the probability that yi is bigger than tau is either equal to 1 over n or it is at most 1 over n. So the probability that tau is at most 1 over n. This will, uh, sorry, the probability that tau is at, uh, y is at most tau, this will be at least 1 minus 1 over n. So, these things here, they are all at least 1 minus 1 over n. So, what we're seeing here is just the sum of all these 1 minus 1 over n to the power of i minus 1 times the probability that yi is at least z. And this we can actually simplify because this is a geometric sum. We are getting that this is 1 minus 1 minus 1 over n to the power of n divided by 1 minus 1 minus 1 over n to the power uh, to no power to the power of 1 times probability that yi is greater than z and those are the same so let me just write y1 at this point. Now here you see that this denominator we can simplify a lot and this way we get our fancy factor times n times the probability that y1 is at least z. And this we can now write as our fancy factor, 
times the sum of these probabilities because they are all identically distributed. Now finally, we'll have to compare this to the probability that the maximum of these yi is at least z. And this is also easy because the probability that the maximum of all i, yi, is at least z, this is something that we can write as the sum of the following probabilities, y1 is less than z, and y2 and y3 and so on, up to yi minus 1, those should all be less than z, and then the probability that yi should be at least z. This here, this is something that is at most 1, so what we're getting here is exactly the sum of these probabilities. And in combination, this now shows also that here the probability that the value that we select is at least this factor times the probability that the maximum is at least z. Good. So why do we care? Why is this interesting? Because now what we're actually doing is we're setting one price at which we are stopping the sequence and then the the respect the first bidder who's willing to pay this much will pay us the price. And the question is how are how good are we doing in terms of revenue this way? And it's not entirely straightforward because there's again a step in between which uh, uses the um, uh, the virtual values. So what will our mechanism now look like? So our mechanism for a single item will be Choose the P star as the maximum of the inverse of the virtual value function evaluated at zero and the inverse of the CDF evaluated at one minus one over n. And we sell the item the first bidder whose value exceeds p star and of course this bidder then pays p star. And our claim is The posted price mechanism gives a one minus one minus one over n to the n approximation. to the optimal expected revenue. Good. So what's the statement here? We now 
compared to the mechanism with the optimal expected revenue, we actually know what this mechanism would be. It would be the second price auction with a reserve, and this exactly would be the reserve. But of course, you wouldn't want to just take the first bidder who shows up, who's willing to pay this reserve. This wouldn't give you optimal revenue because you still need the competition among the bidders. Otherwise, your revenue would be too low. And we do this now by not only having this reserve price from our second price auction here um, as part of our posted price, but we'll also have something else which kind of replaces the competition of the different bidders. And now our mechanism is very simple. It just takes this as a posted price and whoever is the first one who's willing to pay this price gets the item and pays this much. And the point should be that this price here should be chosen in a way that um, it is not too low, which means that bidders are, um, uh, which would mean that our revenue would be too small because the probability of selling the item gets too high. But at the same time, it shouldn't be too high because then the probability of selling the item gets too low. And we'll always have to find the sweet spot of the price and the probability of selling the item at this price. Good, let's prove this. And it is surprisingly easy given that we've already proven this other theorem. Let yi be the virtual value of yi, but at least zero. So this is a non-negative random variable, and those are independent. The optimal virtual welfare is therefore just the maximum of all these yi. Which means that the expected optimal revenue is the expectation of the maximum of these yi. And we can now The previous theorem with tau being the revenue and uh, the virtual value function applied to p star. Why can we do this? What was p star? p star was the maximum of um, the inverse of the u virtual value function in zero and this other term which is the uh, comes from the inverse of the CDF. Now maybe let's go back to our theorem. What will we have to verify? We'll have to verify that tau fulfills one of these two conditions. The tau that we're choosing now um, either guarantees that the probability that um, we exceed that one of the y's exceeds it is equal to 1 over n or that this tau is 0 and the probability that we see something positive should be at most 1 over n. And we can now do exactly this because we can now just see uh, what happens in which case. So it might not happen that this p star is equal to inverse of the CDF of 1 minus 1 over n. What will happen then? Then the probability to see something bigger than tau, this is exactly equal to yi 
being at least phi of p star, because tau was equal to p of, uh, phi of p star, and then p star is exactly what we know it is, and if we now apply the inverse of phi, then we can write this also as vi is greater than the inverse of f at 1 minus 1 over n. But this is exactly 1 minus f of f inverse of 1 minus 1 over n. And this will be exactly 1 over n. Okay, so then we are safe. Otherwise, p star will be phi of 0. So tau will be 0. Because tau was, once again, uh, phi of p star. I forgot the this is p star with the inverse of phi at 0. So tau would be 0. And phi of p star would also be at least the inverse of f at 1 minus 1 over n. And so we get the same kind of an argument. Now the probability that yi is greater than tau, this will be equal to the probability that yi is greater than phi of p star. This will be equal to probability that vi is greater than p star and this will be at most 1 over n. Good. So we've now verified that this choice of tau fulfills the uh, the assumption that we had in the previous theorem so by the previous theorem, the expected value that we're selecting will be at least 1 minus 1 minus 1 over n to the power of n times the expected maximum. And this here on the left hand side, this is exactly the expected virtual welfare of our mechanism. And this here, as I was saying, this, this is expected. optimal virtual welfare. Indeed, this proof feels a little complicated to me. Maybe just because um, people who invented them uh, this for them, this first thing that we showed, this profit inequality, was just something that they knew. And then also dealing with virtual values feels very straightforward. But what you see here is that if you know about virtual values, then suddenly you can apply theory from all over um, 
And now all you have to do is you only have to calculate with virtual values. And the funny thing is all this, these payments are never actually even appearing anywhere in here. So all we're doing is we're always only comparing expected virtual welfare when we now want to make any arguments regarding um, revenue. Once again, how did this work? We set a price and then we showed that um, this price has the property that either um, the sequence gets stopped at every point in time at with probably exactly equal to 1 over n or with probably at most 1 over n and the price is equal to our reserve price of the second price auction with a reserve. Good. So next I'd like to tell you a little more about what you can actually do if you do, if you insist, for example, not on truthfulness. What could you do then? And also, what if you go beyond just a single item? It is now time to conclude our discussion of maximizing revenue, although we've barely scratched the surface at this point. We've only seen the very first steps that you could take to maximize revenue and there's so much more to explore. One thing that you might want to ask, for example, why was it that we were insisting on truthfulness? What if you took a non-truthful mechanism? For example, if you're selling a single item, why would you use, if you wanted to maximize revenue, why would you use the first price, uh, the second price auction and not the first price auction? It feels that in the first price auction, bidders are paying more. So doesn't this is, feel like a good idea? It feels like a good idea, but there's something you have to take into consideration. Namely, because this is a non-truthful mechanism, bidders won't usually bid their true values, but something else. Namely, we can think of bidders being in a base Nash equilibrium, for example. And then we would ask, what's the expected revenue of that base Nash equilibrium? And then you could compare the first price auction with the second price auction and see which one gives more expected revenue in equilibrium. And what you'll come up with is, actually, it doesn't matter. Both of them in expectation, in equilibrium, give the same revenue. And in the lecture notes you find a proof sketch of an argument that tells us that um, if all bias distributions are regular, there's no mechanism M prime that has a base Nash equilibrium in which the revenue is higher than in the dominant strategy equilibrium of the virtual welfare maximizer. This means that you could, of course, construct a non-truthful mechanism and then look at a base Nash equilibrium, but eventually all that you could be doing is exactly what you can also do with this truthful dominant strategy in sound of compatible mechanisms. How do you prove such things? You show something like Meyerson's lemma, but not for dominant strategy incentive compatibility, but in the context of base Nash equilibria. The same arguments actually go through. That's why we are not covering this in class, because eventually it is just doing the exact same, exact same steps, except for writing expectations around everything. And then, how would you maximize um, the, um, how would you maximize revenue in the base Nash equilibrium? You could actually go through the exact same steps that we went through last time, and you would again end up with the virtual welfare. So maximizing virtual welfare 
also maximizes the expected revenue among all non-truthful mechanisms in their respective base Nash equilibrium. Good. So, this is one thing that will not give you higher revenue. One other thing that I'd like to briefly talk about is what happens with multiple items. What if I now just had, say, two items? And I mean not two identical items, two identical items, then you could just understand all of this as a, um, as a usual single parameter setting in which you can just apply everything that we've done so far. But in such a multi-parameter setting where valuations are different, where you have one item which you value with one value and you have another uh, item which you value at a different value. And then pretty strange, strange things can happen. Let's see this in an example. Let's just assume the, that we have one buyer and two items. V1, that is the value for item one. V2 will be the value for item two. And we now assume that both items together we just have a value of v1 plus v2. So just additive, maybe the most straightforward way that you that this could ever be happening. Now we'll have v1 and v2 distributed independently and identically drawn from the uniform distribution just on the set 1, 2. What can happen now? Well, we now have two items. We have one buyer, and this buyer can actually have four different valuation functions. It can be one for both items, it can be one for item two, two for item two, or two for item one, one for item two, and it can be two for both items. How would you maximize revenue here? Well, one thing that you might be tempted to say is, okay, I just sell each of the items independently, separately. What, would the, uh, what kind of revenue would this give you? Um, this would be my first mechanism. We sell the items separately at prices pj star. Now, what revenue would you be getting? Depends now on whether you set pj star to 1 or to 2 for which item. And you can just go through all the four cases that you're getting. You could set the item, the price for the first item to 1 or to 2, the second price to 1 or to 2. And what you end up with is that Actually, you will never get a, a revenue, an expected revenue that exceeds two. Why that? Because the, the expected revenue from the first item will be one and also from the second item it will be one. Because 
You could either set a price of one or lower, then you would definitely always get this price, but this would be one or less, or something higher than one, but at most two, and that you would get only half of the time. So the revenue will be at most two. But let's see my other mechanism. What we'll do is sell only both items together at price three. What revenue are we getting now? When is the bidder buying that? It will buy the item whenever one of the two values is two and the other is either one or, or two, doesn't matter. So the revenue will now be three unless both items are valued at only one, which happens with probability one minus one over a quarter, which is nine quarters, which is bigger than two. So what you might have thought here is, these items really have nothing to do with each other. Bitter one just has a value for the first item, for the second item, and the value for both items together is just the sum. So there's nothing um, that makes bidder one want item two less or more when he has or hasn't item one. But as it turns out, maximizing revenue, you still want to kind of sell both items together. Hmm. This is what makes these things so super complicated. But it doesn't even stop there. Sometimes you even want to sell lotteries. So you'll find a more complicated example in the lecture notes in which the revenue optimal mechanism isn't even as simple as this, like I pay, uh, I give you these, these items for sure and you pay me this much, but it is rather um, two choices. The Bidder can buy either a safe choice or they can buy a lottery ticket in which they get one item for sure and another item with a certain probability. And suddenly this has a higher revenue offering these two choices, one of which is this strange lottery ticket. This suddenly gives you more revenue than any sort of this bundle pricing. Good. So the point I want to make here is that things are complicated whenever you move away from a single item. Nonetheless, there has been a lot of fantastic research on this, trying to better understand how you can at least get approximately optimal revenue. So one thing um, that was a great result, for example, was showing that taking the better of the, the, whatever gives you the higher revenue of selling both items together or selling both, uh, selling all items in a bundle. This will always give you a constant factor approximation of the optimal revenue if you have one buyer and the valuations are additive. And there has been a lot of further research on this. Good. So this concludes our discussion of revenue. I hope that you got some very interesting insights. I hope it wasn't too confusing, although, as I was saying, we only saw the nice parts to some extent, and I'm, I'm showing you that there's a lot more under the surface that we scratched here. Please reach out to me if you have any questions. Stay safe. See you next time. Bye.